Hi church, good morning, welcome to the Sabbath, welcome to the Lord's Day, welcome to Sunday morning, and we are going to spend a little time together centering ourselves on the Lord and what the Lord requires of us. When I was a kid, I used to dream about snow days that would last forever. You know, you could go out and make snowmen after snowmen. You would have snowball fight after snowball fight. No school, just board games and sleeping in and reading. And, well, you get the idea. Well, let me tell you, I would go back in time and tell little me, don't ask for that kind of stuff. Because uh, it's not as fun as it sounds. Rick Steves in his European travel videos once said living in Versailles during the time of the Sun King was like living in perpetual enforced leisure. The term seems appropriate right now, doesn't it? Perpetual enforced leisure. I talked to some of you and you're baking breads, you're growing backyard crops, you're working on puzzles, you're doing pottery, you're doing photography, you're doing those board games, some are sleeping in longer. Now, I do want to say some people are back to work and doing great work. Um, some people have never stopped working and have actually done extra work, um, are important frontline workers and essential workers, and we thank you for that. But this idea of little me thinking this would be so great, right? Well, it sometimes feels like the world as a whole is on sabbatical. Now, the word sabbatical comes from a Greek word meaning of the Sabbath. Now, Sabbath is a word itself that we know, right? Um, but we don't always know what it means. And so today we're going to spend a little time thinking about Sabbath comes from Sabbat, meaning to rest. Um, and before we get too far into that in today's scripture, I want us to think about a little history. Now, I know some of you just got really excited and others, your eyes just glassed over when I said the word history. But I think it's going to help us understand what we're supposed to do on Sundays. So let's use a third word. So we've heard before sabbatical and we've heard Sabbath. Now let's look at Shabbat. Shabbat is a Hebrew word meaning, you guessed it, to rest. But it also means cessation, like to stop. And this is and was Judaism's word for Saturday. And that's the seventh day of their week. It often seems it was based on the idea of reminder that God took one day of creation to rest. It's a reference to Genesis 2, 2. By the seventh day, God had finished the work that he, give me just a second here. The God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of the creating he had done. Now, your versions might read a little differently, but the point is, on the seventh day, God finished the work, then God rested from the work, and God rested to notice creation. So traditionally, Shabbat observances entails refraining from things that would feel work-like, like plowing and reaping a field, grinding and kneading and baking bread, no shearing of wool or weaving, no making two threads, or untying those two threads, no writing or erasing two or more letters, no building or demolishing, no extinguishing a fire, and no transporting an object. There's a longer list than that, but I think you get the idea of what they're asking themselves to stop from. Now, for Orthodox Jews, this is men having to figure out how to live into the present contemporary life with these things, the practical world. Like, how do you is extinguishing a fire also the same as turning off a light in a room? So what about electricity? And what about, as you know, it's funny thinking about electricity, we're in the second week of half uh, power at the parsonage, and I'm realizing in the midst of this how much we use electricity. So I understand that for them, they had to come up with contemporary and more modern ideas of trying to figure things out. They decided no to electric ovens, but there are things like Shabbat clocks that will time out the timer. Some people in the past have even hired Gentiles to turn on and off their lights for them. With the distance of cars um, from the synagogue, it had been decided that if you were driving from your home to the synagogue, that would be okay for transportation. But if you could walk, that was better. 
For elevators, though, they were ruled out. So they created things called Shabbat elevators, which literally will stop on every floor without somebody pushing a button so that no work had to be done. No, I'm not critiquing or overanalyzing anything our Jewish brothers and sisters do. I just think it's important that we understand where our words also come from, and they always have roots. And our root of Sabbath comes from this idea of Shabbat. Now, Christians are going to keep some of this, but they're going to change some of it as well. One thing that we definitely do do is the increase of holiness on this day. Jews who practice Shabbat will center themselves on remembering and keeping the Sabbath. On a holy day, these followers are encouraged to read, study, and discuss the Torah or this holy book, to sing special songs. They're told to attend synagogue for prayers. They're told to spend time with family and friends, to have marital relations in bed, or to sleep a little longer. Shabbat is used by ushering candles into the light and reciting blessings. There are also three festive meals to be eaten. Okay, so that's the idea of where our root of the word Sabbath comes from. But how did we get from that to where we are today? Now, the first, mainly Jewish early Christians, people like Peter or James, the brother of Jesus, are going to follow that Saturday Shabbat. But very soon, things are going to start to change. They're going to realize that for Christians, Sunday becomes the holy day because that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. So people start to celebrate both, Saturday and Sunday. Now, I do want to take just a side note because I think it's fun to think about. Some of you are thinking, well, where does the word Sunday even come from? Is it the sun or is it S-O-N? But I do want to push us away from that a little bit because it isn't Jesus' name that gives it that day. It's actually kind of fun to think about. But most of our days are named what they are because of Norse gods. So, Sunday is the Norse god Suna, the sun goddess. Monday is the Norse moon god, Manai. Tuesday is Trier, the god of dueling. Wednesday is Odin's day. And Thursday is one of your favorite Avengers, Thor's day. Friday is either Frigg, Odin's wife, or Freya, another Norse goddess. So, those names are not uh, corresponding either Jewish or Christian. They are corresponding to Norse stuff, and we still use that today. You might not have known that. Just a nerdy side note for you. But so, yeah, we start to switch from Saturday to Sunday. And then the days begin to get confused. And people, early Christians, are beginning to reference Colossians 2.16, which says, Therefore, do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food and drink, of observing festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. So don't let anybody critique you because you don't observe the Sabbath, right? The Apostle Paul is going to tell us that on Sunday we need to break bread. We need to give help to the poor. The early church father, Eusebius, says for Christians that it needs to be transferred from Saturday to Sunday. And by the second century, so really pretty early on, Ignatius of Antioch is saying that he approves of non-observance with the Sabbath. He says, let us therefore no longer keep the Sabbath after the Jewish manner and rejoice in days of idleness. But let every one of you keep the Sabbath after a spiritual manner, rejoicing in meditation of the law not in relaxation of the body, admiring the workmanship of God, and not eating things prepared the day before, nor using lukewarm drinks and walking within a prescribed space, nor finding delights in the dancing and the playouts which have no sense in them. And after the observance of the Sabbath, let every friend of Christ keep the Lord's day as a festival, the resurrection day, the queen and chief of all the days. So he's beginning to switch us off from not doing things um, the way that the list was. Um, He uses the word, you know, rejoicing in meditation of the law, not relaxation of the body, and instead begins to switch Sunday to a day of celebration, kind of like a mini Easter. And that's what we call Sunday. We could say as Christians, every Sunday is a little bit of Easter for us. So what do you do on Easter? Well, maybe you have eggs, right? Or an egg hunt. You take time to worship God. You rejoice for what happened. So we're beginning to see a shift already in that second century. The first, uh, our great reformer, Martin Luther, will begin to be one of the first to say that actually Sabbath is a civic institution established by human authority, not by God. And he says that if we're going to use it anyway, we should use it for public worship. In other words, he believed we should go to church. 
Another reformer, very similar timing, is Zacharias Eusinus, who said to keep the habith, uh, to keep holy the Sabbath is not to spend a day in slothfulness and idleness, but to make a day for the Lord. <laughs> and American Protestant denominations in the U.S. began to do some different things. They create Sunday laws, if you've ever heard of blue laws, where certain things can be bought and certain stores can be open or not. In 1998, John Paul II wrote a letter saying on how to keep the Lord's Day holy. He encouraged Catholics to remember the importance of keeping the Sabbath holy, urging that it was not meant to lose itself into the frivolous weekend more mentality. Okay, that's your history lesson. And I know it was long, but I think what I want you to see is how this has changed over time, how this has shifted from the traditional Jewish understanding of Shabbat into something a little more I don't know, different, right? Not one better or the other, but just a little complicated, the issue here, right? Through time. So Christians have moved off of Saturday onto Sunday, and there's some confusion about what that day should be. It's less about what you can't do and more about what you should do. Now, I think a lot of this has to do with the way Jesus viewed the Sabbath. And in our readings today, Mark chapter 2, and then I'm going to actually jump us into Mark chapter 3 because it continues this thought. He's talking about Sabbath to us. On Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples walked along. They began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Remember we talked about don't mess with the fields on the Sabbath. So how's Jesus going to prepare to respond to them? What's he going to say? Because he knows that they are in violation of Shabbat. But he surprises the religious leaders of the day. He says, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the day of Abthar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which was lawful only for the priest to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. He's saying, look, David, the king, the line of the Messiah, well, he did way worse on the Sabbath. He ate bread that was already made and given just to priest alone. We're just hungry. Should you deny the hungry on Sabbath to eat food? He says to them, the Sabbath was made for men, not man for the Sabbath. Now, we'll get into all that a little bit later because he responds after. So the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Now, in this next chapter, Mark 3, he's going to continue to talk about the Sabbath. When I have a heading in my Bible that says Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some were looking for an excuse to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked him, which is, asked him and all those gathered, Which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. He gave them a chance to answer, what is Sabbath for? Right? And we all know the answer should always be good and life instead of evil and killing. Right? But they didn't respond at all to him. And so he says to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and the hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. So what is Jesus saying about the Sabbath? I know lots of us get confused, and history has been definitely convoluted. Some of us call it the Lord's Day. Some of us say it's a day of rest. Some of us say it's a day not to drink, like the blue laws, or a day to sleep in, like the term weekend sometimes refers to. But what is it really? Is it rest? Is it rules? I think Jesus told us when he said, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made for man. It's made to help us. We weren't made because of Sabbath. We were, Sabbath is a tool that we are to use. And the Lord is Lord even of the Sabbath. In other ways, it isn't about God needing a rest. It's about us needing a rest. It's a tool. But it's more than a rest. It's a recentering on God each week. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath because he is Lord always. But on this particular day, we are to claim him as Lord. We are to do right by him. 
We are to be the ones standing up when the Pharisees stood silent and saying, yes, God, Sabbath is a day to do good. It is a day to bring forth life and hope and healing. It is a day to feed his sheep and clothe his lambs. We are to rest from what the world expects and instead rest in his embrace and struggle to do what he wants out of us. The words in Exodus 20.8 say, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. A Sabbath to the Lord. Honestly, I had a whole other sermon prepared to preach for you this week when I started reading these I was leaning into rest and renewal in a certain way. And then I read this again and I realized Jesus doesn't say to us to just rest and take a break, which sure, we all need in a certain way, but it's not exactly what he's saying, right? He's saying here, Sabbath is a realignment. If you've ever thrown out your back, you know that sometimes the muscles need to be realigned, put back into place to give you the support you need for the rest of the week. Sabbath, Sunday, is a realignment for our lives, for our souls. It isn't so much the practices that you do or don't do. As long as you have the feeling of the core of Jesus and God at your center. It isn't what you do, but who you do it for. That's how we know we're doing Sabbath right. We see it as a day of rest because we just keep blazing on through our lives. That's what's throwing COVID partially out of alignment for us because we're used to moving like meteorites through the sky of our days. But God is saying, take a second and really see where is your core? Where's your hope? What can you really do with God? Jesus is as much Lord of the Sabbath as he is Lord of the dance. Our Bible says there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. He watches over our time of movement, but he also watches over our time of calming. It's like when you exercise. You should have a warm-up and a cool-down after the really intense part in your days. What if the Sabbath becomes the warm-up and the cool-down time to really help us balance out everything else going on in our lives? Think about it this way. Let me tell you a story. One man challenged another to an all-day woodworking, wood chopping competition. The challenger worked very hard, stopping only for a very brief lunch. The other man had a leisurely lunch and took several breaks during the day. At the end of the day, the challenger was so excited he knew that he had won because the other guy had taken way too much time to rest. But the challenger was surprised and annoyed to find that the other fellow had chopped substantially more wood than he had. I don't get it, he said to the man. Every time I checked, you were almost taking a rest, yet you chopped more wood than I did? Ah, but you didn't notice, said the winning woodsman, that I was sharpening my axe when I sat down to rest. L.S. Schaefer wrote that in a part of his book, Grace. Right now, COVID-19 feels like the warm-up or the slowdown of our days, doesn't it? It feels like the calm, the break, the sabbatical. But I think the question we need to be asking ourselves is, how are we using that time? As Jesus asked, are we doing good or doing evil? Are we saving a life or killing it? Now, that seems extremes, but Jesus was asking the extremes because he thought then we could give an answer. Jesus didn't want the regality of rules to get in the way of doing what God wanted us to do. When we define ourselves by any set of rules so much that we can't love, then those rules are wrong. When we push ourselves so far into rules that we let people be hungry or be hurt right in front of us, and we say, oh, well, we're standing on our traditions, then our traditions are wrong. We need to think first what God would want us to do. And that's always to love. God was really upset that the leaders didn't understand if they could help and they chose not to and they said it was because of God, then they didn't really know God. And maybe we don't always either. Are we answering Sabbath correctly? Jesus knew he had to teach the people in that moment a message. Even if that was going to put him on the radar to the cross, and we hear that at the end of Mark, that because of the way that he taught them about Sabbath, they start planning to kill him. The Sabbath message to him was so important, though, that he would put his life on the line for it because he's teaching us how to have a better way to celebrate God, to honor God's day. 
And what is that? To make a positive difference in the world. Sabbath is about centering yourself on God so that you can show God to the rest of the world. Maybe it's like how the Jews read their scripture on Sabbath or spend time with family. Or maybe it's how the early Christians gave money to the poor. And maybe it's how later refused to drink too much alcohol on this day because they realized vices just made it harder for them to be present to who they were. Or maybe it's how you take a break and go into nature on Sabbath and truly listen to creation. Instead of looking at Sabbath as a day that we just rest and what not to do, what if we instead says, what does God require of me today? Now, if you've been reading your scriptures, you know that Jesus often took a break from the crowds to recharge, to pray, to go to the mountain, to be present to creation. Well, I've heard one of you say to me, COVID-19 has taught me I know what retirement feels like, and maybe that's not a bad way to think about it. Some of you are retired watching this. Some of you know that'll come in years. But how are you using time of rest? That's a question you need to ask yourself. How are you using your time in your days? God is saying about Sabbath is that we need to let the world pass from our mind and only put God in the forefront, at least for one day, if we can't do it for the whole rest of the days. To let our burdens go, to turn off the cell phone maybe, or not check your email, to forget that to-do pile, to instead take the extra patience needed when dealing with your children, to put yourself in your favorite chair, to pray for your neighbor, to make a dish of food for somebody that's shut in, to less think about what the world defines as success, and instead ask yourself, what does God define as holy? and important. And ask ourselves, are we doing that for just one day out of the week? According to a Greek legend in ancient Athens, a man noticed that the storyteller Aesop of Aesop's Fables was playing childish games with kids. Now Aesop seemed to be at peace and having happiness and laughing and acting like a child, But the man could only laugh at him and jeer at him and say, why are you wasting this time on these frivolous activities? Aesop responded by picking up a bow. He loosened the strings on the bow and placed it on the ground. Then he said to the critical Athenian, now answer the riddle, if you can. Tell us what an unstrung bow implies. Well, the man looked around for several moments and He had no idea where the message was or the thought that Aesop was going with. Aesop explained, if you always keep a bow bent, it will eventually break. But if you let it go slack, it will be more fit for use when you want it. People are like that. We're at our best when we've allowed ourselves to be a little childish, to have a little time to renew, to loosen our bow. Yes, we are to be like God on that seventh day, but what did God actually do on that seventh day? God rested from the work so that God could see all of the beauty of creation. God used the time to relish what was already in the world, to appreciate, to care. Take time to recharge and renew, friends, on this Sunday, on this Sabbath, on this Lord's Day, on this day of resurrection, this Easter day we celebrate. Be like a child. Be a healer. Be a hope giver. Be a lover of life. Appreciate creation. Be renewed emotionally and spiritually so that you can be stronger disciples and world livers tomorrow. Be relaxed. Be what God always wishes we could be every day, if only for one day. God rested and appreciated creation. Today, I'm going to try to do that. That's why the Sabbath was created. So I wonder, do you want to join me on this? If even just for one day, are you ready to take on the role as true Sabbath followers? It's up to you. Amen.